Hi, everyone. I unfortunately have a somewhat unreliable recording system on my computer. So I'm going to re-record the session from either 4.6 or 4.8 right now. So <laughs> sit back and relax if you missed it or if you are re-referencing it. Um, I'm here to talk through it all. So today we'll be talking about decoding, fluency, automaticity, and comprehension. The first one here is about good and bad news. Um, the bad news is that one of my personal favorite ways that I studied was by watching a series on YouTube. Um, the bad news is those videos are gone. The good news is though that I um, took notes watching those videos and I watched each one hour video four times and there were four videos. So I have 16 hours of notes I have been compiling into right now a 22 page document. Um, I'm sure that'll just keep growing because I'm just finding more and more things as every university is now virtual that I can add for all of you. So um, yeah, if you'd like me to share that with you, I would love it if you could just email me roughly when you plan on taking the test as well as like a few resources you plan on using and just kind of your overall plan for passing. So moving past that, um, right now you can pause the video and create a statement that relates fluency, automaticity, and decoding. And then when you replay the video, we'll go into depth with that. So I'm going to start by explaining the Kahoot that we took as a group. It's probably going to be pretty loud here. <laughs> okay, looks like you can see that. I'm going to take it myself so that you can see someone work through the answers. All right, there I am, ready to get started. Answer the first question here, I'm gonna think about instruction that teaches the relationship between letters of written language and phonemes of spoken language. So that relationship there is a pretty broad term. So I'm gonna be thinking about something that's an overarching concept, something that's not quite as specific, but still talks about writing and letters is phonics. Something that's a bit more specific to those actual letters is alphabetic principle. Something that really helps me is thinking about alphabetic principle as a tie to specific letters and letter patterns versus phonics being an overall study of letters, patterns, and things like that. Next, a group of two successes, successive consonants whose phonetic value is a single sound, such as ch in much. So to me, when I say that ch sound in much, I'm only making one movement with my mouth. It's one sound. So when I say that whole word, m, a, ch, those two letters are coming together to make a new sound, which is what a consonant digraph is. Just the opposite there, we would have a consonant blend where we would outwardly hear both sounds. Using knowledge about the conventions of spelling, sound relationships, and knowledge about pronunciation of irregular words. So those are two concepts or products that are part of decoding. So those are two ways that students can figure out what a word means, which is the process of decoding. Comprehension is more about understanding and fluency is more about the rate at which student reads. And if a student reads with fluency, they read with automaticity. So they wouldn't be figuring out irregular words or using knowledge of using conventions of spelling sound relationships because if they're reading with fluency, they would already know the words. So it would be decoding. 
A complex vowel sound characterized by a continually moving tongue shape and changing sound quality. So where you can outwardly hear both sounds made is a vowel diphthong. The word blend doesn't apply to consonants. They change it to diphthong. But when you outwardly feel your mouth making both of those sounds, such as enjoy or boy or now, um, yes, W is included. It's a little weird. Um, that is considered a diphthong. Phonics instruction can be. So students, as they learn letters and apply their understanding of letters or letter patterns, they can either do that from isolating letters in letter lessons or sight word lessons, or they can just in general apply things they know about words. So if their name starts with a K and they see a sign that, that has a K, they see Coles and they say, hey, I know that says K. That would be more implicit. It's not directly taught in isolation. However, they're over time picking up on speech. Phonics instruction that moves from the whole to the smallest part Phonemes and graphemes are not taught in isolation. So explicit is where you're isolating something. It's very specific, like a letter lesson or a sight word lesson, versus implicit is over time they're picking up on things. Blank must come before blank. So phonological awareness comes before phonics instruction. Before I'm able to tie letters to sounds, I need to be able to isolate individual sounds in words. The understanding that there are predictable relationships between letters and sounds is. So to me, this is a bit more specific of a statement, more specific than phonics. So the understanding that there are predictable relationships between letters and sounds, that's a principle. Whereas phonics is an a broader term. It's more about that study of letters and sounds and being able to apply letter patterns or being able to sound out C, V, C, E words because you see an E at the end versus the alphabetic principle is more so that understanding letters make sounds. Most frequently found words students need to know automatically. Those would be sight words. Sight words are high frequency. They are, there are lists tied to certain grades for students. Um, and they are words that they automatically know. They're not decoding them. The five components of reading are phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, as well as vocabulary and comprehension. Backpack driveway, and trash can are examples of compound words. So those are all words that mean something different when they're separated. Light bulb is another one, but when they come together, they have a new meaning. That is the term for a compound word. Cues from everything happening around the unknown word that can help a student figure out a word. Those would be considered context clues. The other options are examples of context clues. Phonological awareness relates to the blank component of language. Well, I know with phonological awareness, under that umbrella, the lights are off. Or you can think talking on the phone is more just hearing. So it's spoken auditory. Therefore, phonics instruction is written and spoken. So we're tying the sounds now to letters. A test with high blank measures what it intends to measure. That is validity. And then a test with high blank produces consistent results. So a student could take the same test two days in a row and would get a similar score. Sorry, I thought it was on the right. It's high reliability. Right. See how I did, yay. Okay, going back to the presentation. I have to quick apologize again. My presentation mode loads very, very slow. So it's going to look a little obnoxious when you can see the slides off to the side, but we'll get through it. Hopefully there's some way that you can zoom in on this zoom. <laughs> so 
Here's that related statement from the Jaeger guide relating decoding and fluency. Um, basically what it says is the less time students spend figuring out words when they're trying to read, the more time they have to actually like think about what the words mean. So if a student is reading a sentence with like seven words and they're pausing to figure out what each word says or even ha what half of the words say, they're probably, by the time they get to the end of the sentence, not remembering what the beginning of the sentence was. Make sure we can see this here. Okay, moving forward. And at any time as well, being a video, you can pause that if you missed something on there. So decoding is figuring out what the letters mean. They can use parts of the word that they know, sounds of the letters that they know in there. They can break it up into word parts that they know. The most tedious way to do this is to sound out each letter and put it all together. So that would be phoneme by phoneme. So for bad, it would be b, at. A bigger, little bit bigger chunks is literally chunking. Um, so you're not taking every individual sound, but you're taking maybe parts that you know, such as F, L, and flower. It's a little bit bigger than phoneme by phoneme. Next, just again to reiterate what decode actually means is figuring out what a word says. So they do that using knowledge of letter sound relationships to accurately read a word. So if they look at a word that they don't know, but it's S-M-A-L-L, -L, they can use their knowledge of the fact that S is the S sound, M is the M sound, A is the A sound, and L is the L sound. So it would make small. So a related question here is which of the following types of activities would be most important for Mrs. Morrow to include on a daily basis when planning instruction for first graders who are developing as beginning readers? The bolded and underlined words really help me frame my question here. So I'm thinking about something that would be valuable daily. I'm going to talk through each of the options. You can pause and write down what you think is the best. All right, read playing it. So activities that introduce students to basic concepts about print, by the time a child is actually beginning to read, they need to have those basic concepts down. They need to know where the word starts, where the word ends. They need to know that print carries meaning. They need to know those things before they're actually able to attend to the individual words on the page. B, activities that emphasize listening to and producing rhyming, alliteration, and similar forms of wordplay. These are all auditory activities. In some way, it would be a better option if we could see them tying those sounds to speech, but we just don't see that here. So I'm gonna look for a better option. C is activities that promote students' development of decoding and other word analysis skills. Now this is something that would be valuable on a daily basis to beginning readers because they're gonna come across words that they don't know but if they know how to figure them out using decoding and word analysis skills, they'll be able to read or develop those reading skills. So C sounds like a very promising answer because it's valuable on a daily basis, it's relevant to beginning readers, and it's an effective practice. D, activities that emphasize memorization of, grade, uh, memorization of lists of grade level appropriate sight words. Memorization does not equal comprehension so that would not be a best practice. So I ruled out D as well. And of course you can pause as I'm going along. Just to restate what those concepts about print are that a student would have down or should have down by the time they're beginning to read, they're listed here. Reading from left to right, top to bottom, letters and words have meaning. We read the words. <laughs> we move from one line to the next, top to bottom, left to right. Illustrations are related to the print, and every book has a front, back, and author. So phonics and other word analysis skills, such as learning common inflectional endings and the orthographic rules governing their addition to words, are critical skills that promote beginning readers' development of proficiency in decoding. So those listed skills support students' development of reading fluency and comprehension. What does that mean? <laughs> so that means through phonics instruction, you're talking about letters and the sounds that letters make. 
And then word analysis skills, you're talking about kind of how to break words apart, how to figure out what words actually mean. So that could look like for a kindergarten class, you are using the word um, un, you're using that beginning. We'll do a prefix for an example. So telling a student that un means like basically not, you can say that was unbelievable. So is that something that's believable? So kind of figuring out how to apply those word parts and give them meaning. Um, so that overall instruction of how to say words and how to break words apart supports the development of fluency because it gives them that those skills that they need to figure out words when they come across them and don't know them. And then when, the more that they're able to figure out words that they don't know and keep moving forward, the more they'll develop comprehension, the more they'll be able to understand the words. For a related question, which of the following best describes the relationship between word decoding and reading comprehension in a beginning reader's development? A, decoding skills and reading comprehension skills tend to develop independently of one another. So a student's ability to figure out what a word says is going to directly affect if they understand it or not. So we're going to rule out A, they are related. B, reading comprehension skills directly facilitate the development of decoding skills. And C, development of decoding skills is secondary to the development of reading fluency and comprehension skills. So both B and C tell me that comprehension comes after decoding. That just doesn't make sense because how are you able to understand a word before you know how to say it? So D is going to be our best option here. Automatic word recognition facilitates development of reading fluency. The more words you can recognize, the better rate at an accuracy with which you'll read, which are components of fluency. And then that fluency, the more you're able to read words, leads to word understanding. First, feel free to pause at any point. So restating definitions here, we want to keep these components separate from comprehension, but under, <laughs> so fluency is a component of comprehension. However, a student that reads with fluency, it doesn't mean that they comprehend what they read. So these fluency components are about accuracy, rate, and prosody. So that prosody is the smoothness with which a student reads, like just the way they sound, they, they sound like they can read. So I could read a sentence with fluency. I could say, I'm going to ice the birthday cake. And then I could go and draw a picture of, an, of a birthday cake, and I could draw ice cubes on top of it. So I read that sentence accurately. I read it at a decent rate. I sounded smooth. I didn't pause or make errors or anything like that. It had expression, like it didn't sound weird, but I didn't understand it. <laughs> so that comprehension comes after fluency. So in order to build reading fluency, Students need to be reading texts that are appropriate for them. It's not appropriate to put a fourth grade level text in a kindergartner's hand because they won't have the skills to figure out those words. Those words won't be familiar to them. So we're going to talk about how to identify texts for students and what that kind of percentage looks like. So the independent level at which you can pretty much trust that children are reading with accuracy, fluency, as well as comprehending the text is 95 to 90% or 95% to 100%. So pretty much over nine out of every 10 words, they're getting right. They're reading a vast, vast majority of the book correctly. So if you had a book with 20 words, there's maybe two that they pause and figure out or that they have to ask, but for the most part, they're taking away from the book what they're intended to. Instructional level, 94 to 90%. So this is where a student is developing. So they could be coming across more specific vocabulary or kind of broader concepts with bigger messages. Um, so when you're incorporating text at the instructional level, 
There are forms of support, such as group reading, like as stated, also semantic maps or pre-teaching vocabulary or group reading of passages or keep close reading of passages or underlining words. Um, those are appropriate at the instructional level. So that can come along with a form of support. Frustrational level are texts that students just basically shouldn't be interacting with. They literally are what they're called <laughs> frustrating. So a student's comprehension is going to fall apart at the point that they're figuring out so many words. So an average, say, second grader book has between two pages at least 10 words and one, at least one out of all those 10 words, they have no idea what it means. On every page, their comprehension is going to hurt because of that. The students are most likely to be successful in their independent reading of a book if, so I'm gonna work from the bottom up here. I'll let you look at the options, pause, what you think is the answer. And replay. D, I'm going to rule out the text primarily deals fictional rather than factual accounts of characters and or events. As well as B, the text does not include compound sentences joined by coordinating conjunctions such as and or but. So the content of the actual text that's being independently read by said person doesn't matter. The content is relevant to the person. A high schooler could have an independent level text that contains sentences, compound sentences, multisyllabic words, it's informational text about whatever. And then you could have a kindergartner with independent level text that has three words on a page. So the content of the text doesn't matter. We're talking about level, which is relevant to an individual. C, the students come from homes where silent reading is extensively modeled and encouraged. So that definitely doesn't hurt a student's literacy. However, based on the answer, we don't have any indication that the child themselves is actually even reading. So we're gonna go with A there. The students can decode and understand the meaning of at least 95% of the words. It just makes sense, it's in the definition, it's our best option. A fifth grade class silently reads an informational text. In subsequent informal assessments, several students are able to read the text orally with fluency, but they demonstrate poor overall comprehension of the text. The teacher could most appropriately address these students' needs by adjusting future instruction in which of the following ways. So what I'm looking at is fifth graders who are likely talking about a specific subject and they're reading an informational text. At some point they were checked for understanding and their understanding wasn't there. And I want to figure out a way that I can help the greatest amount of students. So for D, emphasizing skill building activities that focus primarily on narrative text, we're working here with an informational text. I'm ruling that out. B, providing students with explicit instruction in grade level test taking strategies. So I just don't want students to be testing well. I want them to understand what they're putting on the test. I want to see some type of comprehension improvement. So for A, using informational texts that are written at a student's independent level, I'm looking to help the greatest amount of students here. If I had a fifth graders and I adapted some type of informational text to their independent level, I wouldn't lose that key vocabulary. So you could think about a science class. I wouldn't lose the word nucleus, even if I adapted it to be at a student's in, um, independent level. And if they're reading at their independent level, they're probably like understanding it. So I'm looking to help the greatest amount of students and I can do that through C, introducing a text key vocabulary and guiding the students in a close reading of key passages. Maybe not all students would need that. However, that's the best inclusive answer to help the greatest amount of students in that class. Here we say informational text introduce vocabulary words that are, un that are likely to be unfamiliar in many, to many students in fifth grade. Informational texts may also include academic language structures with which students are unfamiliar. For students to be able to read and comprehend such a text independently, the teacher may need to model and provide students with practice and close reading of key passages of the text, as well as explicitly teach vocabulary prior to reading. 
A second grade teacher pairs students who are reading at approximately the same independent reading level for a partner reading activity. During the activity, the two partners sit side by side and take turns reading aloud from a shared text. Over a period of several days, the partners read a large number of independent texts together. This activity is best designed to promote students what? So if I'm thinking about a second grader reading independent level texts over and over, or a large number of them, um, I can already consider they're probably seeing a lot of the same words. So reading those words over and over again out loud as well as hearing them, what would that help? So D, awareness of new phonics elements. Students won't be encountering new word elements in texts that are at their independent level. Independent levels are about already knowing a lot of the words. So that is not good. C, development of comprehension skills and strategies. So we know nothing about the extent to which they're going back into the text and looking over it. So we're going to rule out C there. That's just, we don't know that they're, I mean, obviously over time, the more that they're looking at it, they're probably going to understand it, but we don't know for a fact. So there could be a better option there. Awareness of key aspects of prosodic reading. So that's that smoothness. So again, we know they're reading familiar texts. We know they're at their independent level. However, we don't know for sure if they have that expression there, which is one of those components of prosodic reading. Um, we don't know how they sound. So we know that they're reading with accuracy. And if it's at their independent rate, or if it's at their independent level that they're able to decode a vast majority of the words, but we, we don't know the ways in which they're saying those words. So A is going to be our best option there, development of reading rate and automaticity. Continued exposure to similar words, which will be evident in independent level text for said second graders, is going to improve that rate and automaticity. Their ability to recognize words, the more that they're exposed to them will improve, and therefore their, the rate at which they can read will improve. So that prasadi again is that overall smoothness of the reading. So that includes phrasing, expression, and intonation. Based on that example, I mean, those things probably will come over time, but A was a better option just because we don't actually know the way that they were saying the words. We just know that they were accurately reading them given that it was at their independent level. And then automaticity review. So that's reading without effort or attention to decoding. It's words they know. So automaticity is definitely a component for fluent reading because fluency takes into account rate as well as accuracy. Um, so if a student can't recognize words, the way they sound when they read is going to fall apart. Um, if I were to read the first sentence with automaticity, I would say reading without conscious effort or attention to decoding. If I were reading that without automaticity, it would sound like reading with without conscious effort or attention to decode, decoding. So at one point or another, I would have sounded out words that I didn't automatically recognize. And that would have made me not fluent because as you can see, the rate at which I read fell apart and the initial accuracy fell apart as well. So sight words are those words that are highly exposed to students. A lot of the lists are relative to grade levels. Um, in kindergarten, of course, you're going to first teach words like and, is, are, we, his, but, go, then, things like that. Um, over time, students will have more and more sight words added to their vocabulary. So sight words, again, high frequency. They know them. They can automatically recognize them. So it's important to note that students might have a sight word list in their brain that they automatically can recognize. That's more complicated than other words that they could recognize, just given the fact that they're frequently exposed to it. So you could take a uh, first grader that looks at the word because and can say it. They see B-E-C-A-U-S-E. -E. They've seen it enough before. Maybe they were directly instructed on it. And they say because. However, you could give that same child another seven letter word with four vowels and they might not be able to say it. 
So sight words can be irregular or regular. So a word like what or the, a student might automatically recognize a no. However, until you actually tell them the TH sound, maybe they'll apply that sound part to another word that starts with TH. They might look at the word that and they might say to have at first. A teacher holds up a series of familiar objects asking students to name each object and isolate the final sound they hear. This type of activity would be most appropriate for students who blank. So we're doing an oral activity. We're isolating the final sound that they hear. We don't know anything about the objects that she's holding up. We don't know anything about how those objects are spelled. We're doing an oral activity. There's nothing indicated about them writing. So B talks about fluency, more than one word, and automaticity and is a component of reading. So seeing that we're doing an oral activity here, we have to rule that out. Um, we're just saying words out loud, and we're, what we're focusing on is isolating the final sound. C is talking about words again, and we're doing an oral activity. So automaticity, yeah, maybe they can automatically identify the object, but orally. D has difficulty sounding out phonetically regular one-syllable words. Again, we're not given enough information really any information about the objects that are being held up. A student might know, hey, that's a pencil, but they might think that the sound in the middle is an S. So we don't know what words, what's being held up, but we do know that they're isolating the final sound, which is a phonemic segmentation skill. We're taking in an individual component of that word. Um, so if we did have pencil again, and a student is struggling to say l is the last sound, well, that would match up with a. That'd be a student that needs help developing phonemic segmentation skills. A student that needs help separating a word into individual sounds. Oh, awareness of print should also be familiar to students before they're actually like reading and decoding. Um, so print awareness, is one of those concepts of print. So it's that understanding that print carries meaning, books contain letters and words. Print awareness also includes the understanding of what books are used for and how a book works, how to turn pages, how to find the top and bottom, how to identify the title, front, back, cover. So before students are actually reading, you should note that they would have this down. A kindergarten teacher hangs labels on key objects in the classroom puts up posters that include words and captions and always has a big book on display for the children's use. This kind of classroom environment is most likely to help promote children's A, recognition that words are composed of separate sounds, B, recognition of high frequency sight words, C, development of automaticity in word recognition, or D, development of an awareness of print. So for A, as well as B, we don't know anything about the words that are up on display and we don't know how they're actually interacting with the words. All we know is that these words are strategically next to meaningful objects. For C, development of automaticity in word recognition, again, we don't know what the labels actually say. We don't know what the book and words and captions actually are. And we don't know if they're actually interacting with them. All we know is that print is closely connected to certain things, which would develop their awareness of print D. B and C are incorrect. Exposing a child to print doesn't directly promote word recognition skills. Given this, the nature of this question, we don't know how closely they're interacting with those captions or those labels. So A is incorrect because phonemic awareness, recognition that words are composed of phonemes, is not directly promoted to by a print-rich environment. So D is our best answer there. Print and awareness encompasses a developing understanding of print concepts and the writing system and understanding of the relationships between oral language and print and familiarity with the ways literate adults interact with and make use of printed materials and writing. Looking forward into comprehension. Comprehension comes after fluency, after students are able to decode words, and certainly after much fun, many days of phonics instruction where they're tying letters to sounds, they're looking at patterns of the way you say words based on the spelling. So 
the definition of comprehension is there to be noted down. And I really hope this recording worked quite badly. <laughs> um, other than that, I found a YouTube channel. I think his name is Chris Moss for distance prep. It was a useful page that I found. I don't know if this is sharing. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Chris Moss. It's like distanceprep.com. Um, and he has specific videos. Some are very specific, like My we don't Chris go Sales, that CIP deep into them. Um, such as he had one that was like poly something. However, his reading instruction lectures, they're like five, six segment minute videos, five, six minute segments. Um, that are a good idea to watch if you're driving somewhere, when you're getting ready to go somewhere, if you're folding laundry, um, just continuing to expose yourself to different ways to engage with the concepts on this test is super helpful. So I think his name was like Chris Moss, I, but if not, um, it's linked in the notes. Uh, so if you send me that email, you'll definitely get it or I'll post it on the canvas, but have a good rest of your night and thanks for watching.